Okay, good morning everybody, and thank you for coming to this talk on saving the ammo leopards. Um, we've got a few challenges, I think, I don't know whether you can see the screen, it looks pretty dark from where I am, but hopefully you can see either that screen or the um, TVs there. Uh, my name is Simon Jones, I'm from the Wildlife Heritage Foundation uh, down in Kent, and um, we'll talk a little bit more around us and what we're doing a little bit later on. Uh, but I thought we'd start with um, a story before we get into the ammo leopards. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I was on holiday with my wife in uh, Kenya, and we were doing a tour of several different um, game reserves, and at one of those game reserves, we decided that we'd go and look uh, for black rhino. Now, for those of you who don't know, there's two sorts of rhino out there, the black rhino and white rhino. Black rhino is kind of the more elusive, they live in the bush a bit. So, we set off in the morning from our camp and headed off to see what we could find. We spent about an hour and a quarter wandering, uh, well not wandering, driving around um, the various different bits of bush, looking through the thicket, see what we could see. And after about an hour and a quarter there, we saw in the middle of one of the bush um, what we've been looking for, a black rhino. Or, to be exact, the backside of the black rhino. So we drove carefully so as not to try and spook it around the front of the bush, and there we were looking straight back at us, was this incredible beast full of power, full of muscle, two incredible horns that were saying, don't mess with me. Yeah, we were really pleased. There, face to face, we were with a cake buffalo. Yeah. Nature was teasing us somewhat. Um, and as impressive as our buffalo friend was, um, we decided we'd leave him to it and we'd go and continue our search for a black rhino. So we carried on driving around different parts of the reserve, um, looking through plenty more thicket, lots more full storms of mounds of earth in the distance that somehow looks a bit like a rhino when we were a few metres away. Um, and after about two and a half to three hours, we decided it wasn't going to be our day. Um, gave up and decided we'd head back to camp. Um, and we were about 15 minutes from camp and then out on one of the last planes we were going to drive through in the distance, our guide had spotted a rhino. Um, we weren't sure we were too far away whether it was a black or a white rhino, but out on a plane, the chances were it was going to be a white rhino. Um, so we drove up, and as we got closer, uh, he, he, the guide actually recognised the rhino, and it was in fact a black rhino, so it was a pretty unheard of experience to see this black rhino out in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the plains. Um, but we drove a bit closer, and the guide says, be ready with your cameras, you'll get one chance at one post, I and mean, it'll probably be a picture of a rhino running away in the distance, um, and that's what we got. And to our amazement, after two or three seconds, he stopped, stared right back at us, and seemed to pose for photos. Um, so it, it was incredible. We spent about five minutes with him being quite calm. Um, so it was an incredible end to what was three hours driving through the bush. So, probably standing there thinking, I've come to listen to a talk on ammo leopards, what the hell is he babbling on about black rhinos for? Well, kind of my experience in two and a half, three hours of this story is a little bit similar to the last 20 to 30 years of the story of the Amber Leopard. We started off our journey in the morning in hope rather than expectation of actually achieving what we wanted to set out to achieve. Along the way, there was a few false storms, and at times it would be really easy to give up hope and let's move on to another species. But we persevered with it, and at the end of the day, had the most amazing experience. The story of the Leopard, I'm trying to was that me? The story of trying to save the animal leopard is very similar, but instead of two to three hours, it's 20 to 30 years. So, about the animal leopard then. Well, to give it its scientific name, Panthera pardus orientalis. The Panthera pardus bits tells us it's a leopard, the orientalis bits tells us that it's an animal leopard. So, I thought we'd have a little bit of audience participation to begin with. Um, it's okay, you am going to get up and run around the room, just going to have to raise one hand up in the air and you can even choose whether you raise your left or your right hand. Um, so I'm going to give you one word, uh, and all I want you to do is think of a region or an area of the world or a country in the world. Okay, and that word is leopard. Okay, now how many people, and this is your bit with the raising the hand piece, how many people here have thought of Africa or a country in Africa? I thought that would be most of you. And so if I was sitting where you were, I'm sure I would be raising my hand as well. Did anyone sitting in here think of Russia? A few of you, well that's good. In fact, I thought there'd be some at the back that would. I thought there'd be uh, 
Uh, it's, it's the um, MLM has had quite a lot of publicity lately, so it means that some of it, some of it is working and, uh, and doing its job well. Um, okay, last question for now. How many people before this expo event has heard of the Ammo Leopard? Wow, most of you. That's good. more than I thought it was going to be, which again is, is good news. So, a little bit around the Ammo Leopard then to start with. Uh, it comes from the far east of Russia. Um, our, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail around what its natural habitat is uh, in a moment. There are only around 35 ammo leopards left in the wild today. Some people believe that that number is now as low as 30, um, so there's really not many at all. Why are they so endangered? What are the main threats? Well, it's probably no surprise to see that um, loss of habitat is right up there, as is hunting and poaching. Why is it no great surprise? because you can pick pretty much any animal that's endangered at the moment and I can almost guarantee that you'll find lots of habitat and hunting and poaching right up there as the reasons, um, as some of the main reasons as to why they're so endangered. So, to give you a break from my talking for a minute, I thought we'd start with having a look at some ammo leopards. So we've got a clip from the BBC's Planet Earth series um, on some ammo leopards out in the wild. This female has the added pressure of having to provide for her one-year-old cub. It will be another 12 months before he'll be able to fend for himself. The bickering vultures have abandoned the carcass. It's a valuable discovery. The vultures have left behind plenty of good meat, but it's stiff with frost. The mother works to open the hide and make feeding a little easier for her cub. There are only 40 Amor leopards left in the wild. still falling. The harshness of the winter here hinders their increasing numbers. It takes one of these females longer to raise her young to independence than it does a leopard in Africa. If the mother can sustain her cub for a few more weeks, spring will bring an increase in prey and her task will lighten. Okay, so there's some ammo leopards out in the wild. Um, so, whereabouts is that wild? You kind of see that they're living in a forest area there. Um, if you can see on the map here, I don't know whether you can see the screen here, but this area around here, this little, the little dot here, is the Kidrevea Reserve out in the far east of Russia. That now is the only place in the whole world where you can find and the leopards in the wild. Once upon a time, this whole area around here, you could have found ammo leopards across into China, up into Russia here, and down into um, North Korea. Um, so, so if you go back a good number of years, they were quite widespread, but now we are restricted to just these few here. But what's this round, larger brown area there? This is an area called the Lazowski Reserve, and this is an area that's been designated 
for a release program for animal leopards. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail a little bit later on. So, out in the Amoa Valley, and that's where they're called the Amoa Leopards because they're areas where the Amoa River runs through and then you have the Amoa Valley. The seasons vary greatly. Um, during the summer, the seasons, the temperature can get up to about plus 25 degrees centigrade. Now, for those of you living down in the south of England, you may remember a couple of weekends ago, we had the Indian summer that they've been promising us since about March, and it lasted all of about four days. Um, but the temperatures were about 25, 26, 27 degrees. Um, and I don't know about you, I certainly heard some people complaining how hot it was, that they couldn't sleep. Um, I heard other people just talking around how nice it was to have some hot weather at last. Um, that's the kind of temperatures in the summer that the Amber Leopard has to cope with. During the winter, however, it gets down as low as minus 30 degrees centigrade. Now, again, in the south of England, we probably have more snow and more cold snaps over the last couple of years than we've had um, just recently. But probably over the last, during those cold snaps, the temperatures got down to probably minus 10, if you were unlucky, minus 11, minus 12 degrees. So if you think back to how cold it felt when you went out on that cold snap, and then you imagined it being three times colder, that's the type of temperatures and the change in temperature that the Amaro Leopard has to cope with. One of the ways it's evolved to cope well with that is during the summer, its coat is about two and a half centimetres thick. During the winter, it has a completely different coat and it's about seven centimetres thick. So that clip we just saw from the BBC was obviously taken in winter, snow on the ground was a bit of a clue, and you would have seen that the leopards were much more fluffy than if you imagine what you see of African leopards on the TV. The African leopard gets it easy by comparison, it doesn't have to worry about being able to cope with such fluctuating temperatures. We talked earlier around some of the main threats um, and loss of habitat, but what do we really mean by loss of habitat? Well, the Amber Leopard lives in a vast area of rainforest. Um, once upon a long time ago, that whole area it lived in was this huge, vast expanse of rainforest. And what's happened as humans have come in and populated bits of that area, they're starting to destroy that by creating starting forest fires and, and plenty of logging going on. Again, it's pretty common for many areas of rainforest. But those particular activities, what they're doing is destroying huge areas of the rainforest and huge areas of the um, leopard's habitat. And not just the leopard's habitat, but their prey's habitat as well. Um, so not only do we have so few leopards left, uh, but also they're now living in little pockets of forest and not even able to come into contact with each other because the areas that we've destroyed through the middle of the forest are too wide for the leopards to be crossing. Hunting and poaching. There is a difference. Does anybody know the difference between hunting and poaching? It doesn't matter where in the world you are, poaching is illegal. Um, it's not something you should be doing to get away with. Hunting's a bit of a different story. You can still go to South Africa, buy a permit, go hunt a lion, shoot it, and take it to boarding home with you. Personally, I can't imagine why people would want to do that, but it does, and they pay a lot of money to do that. So hunting isn't necessarily illegal. However, hunting of amur leopards, I'm pleased to say, is illegal. So, um, it kind of, in case the amur leopard, the hunting, the poaching bit is going out and killing a leopard. Um, and unfortunately, it does happen. Um, but it's just not just the leopard that we need to be worried about. It's also the prey for the leopard as well. You can still go and hunt things like a seeker deer, which is the um, amur leopard's favourite prey species. If you go and kill too many of the seeker deers, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to destroy the food source for the animal leopard and it's going to either then starve to death or it's going to push it into conflict with humans because it's going to go looking for alternative food sources and that may well be the farm stock. The other thing is the Amur or the Siberian tiger comes from the same area so if you're destroying the food source down it's going to come into conflict with the Amur tiger. But the Amur tiger is the biggest cat in the world so if it comes into direct conflict with the leopard the chances are so the population is declining. As we heard David Attenborough say on that film, the population is as low as 40. Um, that film was made about 2006. So since 2006, that population has decreased already down from 30 to 30. Um, so it's not a big time to do such a high percentage. The amber leopard is the most endangered cat in the world today. There's no other species of big cat which is at more at risk of becoming extinct than the amber leopard. Talked a bit around the numbers, but just to think about it in a bit, look around you now in the room. 
There are more people sitting in this room now than there are amber leopards left in the world today. Quite sobering, of course. And according to the IUCN Red List, the amber leopard 15 years ago was moved from endangered to critically endangered. And you might say, Andy, well, what does that really mean? Um, it's kind of just a word in front of another. But the next step on the ladder from critically endangered is extinct in the wild. So we're not very far with only 30 to 35 leopards left from being to that next step in the ladder. And after that, the next step is just plain extinct. So at that stage, it's too late for you home. I've got a quote here from Dr. John Lewis of uh, Wildlife Vets International. Um, Dr. Lewis is a renowned expert in medicine care for big cats and at Wildlife Heritage Foundation. We're fortunate enough to have him as our vet. And he's also very heavily involved in the Amaro Leopard Conservation Project. Um, he spends three months a year out in the Russian Far East. In fact, he's there at the moment helping with the research team. Um, and he commented here that unless radical action is taken on behalf of these beautiful creatures, then they may become extinct at any time, and that any time isn't that far away. So that's good you are doing a good picture, and you're all sitting there depressed and probably ready to cry into your tissues, but um, there is hope. In 2001, a group of scientists and conservationists met in Vladivostok, out in the Amo Leopards own backyard in the Russian Far East. And they met with a view to coming up with a plan to try and save the species in the wild. And what they agreed upon was that we would start a reintroduction program. Now, when you start looking at a second site, and you remember what we're looking at for that second site is to populate that um, for uh, a conservation stock of, uh, of cats. Now, what that means is slightly different to normal. When you see many documentaries and you talk about setting up a new site, and we're talking about doing, just to remind you on the map again, at this area here, when we talk about setting up a new site there, you often do what we call translocation, which is you take some animals from a one place they are in the wild, and you move them and you start a new population in a different place. 35, 30 to 35 cats left in the wild. And already it's believed that within that number, there's only six or seven breeding females, and probably three or four generations of inbreeding. It wasn't deemed to be a viable solution to move some of those existing population out. So it was thought that the best thing to do was to look at a, a conservation breeding program and starting with a new population in that, uh, that second game uh, reserve area. And again, the reason we do that is for sort of genetic contribution. So we manage very closely the type of cats that we put out there um, through something called the European Endangered Species Breeding Program. And that is a managed breeding program. It is, if you like, an online dating agency for Anglo leopards. Um, now, if you're sitting at home going onto your online dating agency on a computer, you can scroll through, so I'm told, my wife's in the audience, a whole day, um, a whole list of um, potential partners, and you pick out the ones you like the look of, and you go and you pick up, um, oh, I'll go and meet them, you get your red carnation on, and you meet them at Waterloo Station. And my leopards can't really do that. Um, there's normally, if you're talking about the, the conservation population, there's normally some fences stopping them from going out there, even if they couldn't get online and use a computer. Um, so, that is managed by um, a team of people, and the Amaro Leopards, um, what we call the Stud Book, which is like the online dating agency, is managed by um, somebody called Sarah Christie of the Zoological Society of London. And they have a complete breakdown of the genetics and the DNA of every single cat that's on that program. And they decide the best combination of cats to make together to give us the best genetic contribution back out into that second population. <coughs> Um, again, conservation gene pool kind of fits in what we're talking around. But public awareness and education is another very important part of the European Endangered Species Breeding Program. Um, it's all very well having a small group of conservationists and scientists coming up with a plan, but that probably isn't going to give us the success that we need. We need engagement from people like yourselves um, who buy into what we're doing, who are interested in helping to save the species and getting involved in what's big or little way. Are able to. And it's not just people here as well, it's people out 
in the, in the Russian Far East where we're looking to release the cat to, we have to start educating the locals there um, around a leopard doesn't necessarily mean bad news for them. Now, when we're talking around releasing them and pushing them out there, you know, people will often say, well, you've got animals in captivity, why don't you just go and put those in Russia and let them get on with it? So, you know, it's not a case of just sticking them on a plane, dropping them out in a, in a forest in the Russian Far East, hoping they, hoping they survive. The harsh statistics are that 96% of captive bred animals released directly to the wild will be dead within six months. And if you watch documentaries, the most common theory that I have to believe, well, that's because they don't know how to hunt if you're talking about predators. Um, that's not true. A cat knows how to hunt. I saw a captive bred lion that's hand reared, has never lived in the wild the other day, stalking after a pigeon. It caught the pigeon, it killed it, and it sat there and ate it. Never been taught how to hunt. It knew what to do. Your domestic cats at home have never been taught how to hunt, but they seem to know how to go and catch a bird in the garden, bring it in and pluck its feathers all over the lounge carpet. Um, it, it's in their instincts. What you can do is give them experience of hunting before you leave them to it. And that's why we talk around a multi-generation release program. So when we take our cats back out to that area, and um, the, the release area, we'll put some cats to match together, we'll breed them, and then it, normally it would be two or three generations later you'd actually get to release them into the wild. You have to breed out the human impact. Our cats that we have on site down in Kent you keep the, the human contact to an absolute minimum from them. But we still have to feed them, and we turn their food up in a nice shiny wheelbarrow, and they know that a nice shiny wheelbarrow has got a big chunk of meat in it. So if we take one of our cats and we release it into Russia, and it comes across a farmer with a nice shiny wheelbarrow, it's probably not going to end well for the farmer or the cat. So we've got to try and, that's why you do multi-generation. We have to read out the human piece element of it. Okay, I've got another clip now of two little animal leopard cubs born at our site in Kent. going. 
and their passion was a bit cats. So they did something about it, set up the Wildlife Heritage Foundation charity, uh, and we work, we have uh, now 40 cats on site um, at, in Kent, uh, and we work not just with the animals there, but with um, organizations around the world as well. We are the largest specialist big cat breeding centre um, in the country. Uh, as I said, we have 40 cats across 13 different species now. Uh, we have, so it's normal big cats, we have some small cats too. Um, we actually have the smallest cat in the world, uh, which is the rusty spotted cat from Sri Lanka, which is kind of that kind of size. And we have um, Amo tigers, which is the largest, uh, tiger, the largest cat in the world. So as I say, 13 different species. There are actually 36 different species of cat in, uh, in the world today, so with some of having, having all of them, but obviously we're focusing on those that are most endangered. And we are an active member of the EP on the Endangered Species Breeding Programme. We've only just seen um, some of the ammo leopard cubs that we have. Um, in 2008 is when those two were born. As I said, one of them and who's grown up and gone on to continue the programme. But it's not just ammo leopards, um, Sumatran tigers as well uh, we have on site. The last of the remaining island species of tiger. Uh, and again in 2008 we had two little male cubs born, um, both of which have grown up and gone out to continue the breeding program um, and, and again widen and broaden that gene pool. Uh, and in fact this little guy here we're extremely excited about because this was part of the second um, litter of cubs that we had born in August this year. Um, so this was taken into the bow five and a half, six weeks old. Um, and they're still still there. Um, it's just starting to come out with their mum into the open as well now. But the Sumatra tiger is quite a different kettle of fish to the ammo leopard. You know, the ammo leopard in a way is quite lucky because there is somewhere where now we're able to start to look at to release them to. Um, Sumatra tigers, the habitat is being continues to be eroded. There's nowhere to release them to. So the breeding program now for the Sumatra tiger, as with most species of cat, is all about keeping as wide a genetic pool as possible. 20 years ago, Russia was a very different place to what it is now. You know, there would be no hope of releasing ammo leopards um, into the wild if someone was standing here 20 years ago. But things have changed, politically things have changed, um, and we've moved on a long way. And let's hope that in 20 years' time, somebody will be standing up here talking around the release program for the Sumatra tiger. But it's not just the big rock star cats that we have um, down in Kent. We also had success with palace cats as well, and here's three or four little palace cat kittens that were born in 2009. Um, palace cats, for those that don't know, are a little bit bigger than a domestic cat, come from the Himalaya uh, region of the world. Um, out on our stand, out um, in the, right in the far corner um, of the hall, um, we've got a little video running which has got lots of palace cats playing. Um, lots of people have never heard of them, but fall in love with them, because they're quite cute looking, um, but let me tell you, they're feisty little things as well. Okay, but it is, as I mentioned before, it's not just what we do in Kent. Um, as a charity, it's about working with other organisations as well. When you're talking about the Endangered Species Breeding Programme, it's no use just focusing solely on breeding and breeding and breeding, because otherwise you turn into, in this case, an animal leopard farm. Um, you've got to be working with organisations to try and restore the natural habitat um, and a whole ecosystem that goes with that. Um, similarly, it's no use just working on restoring the habitat and not thinking about any, any cats, in this case, that you may want to release. If 20 years ago we'd only focused on trying to restore an area in the Russian Far East to release cats to, we probably would have had some success in getting there by now, but we've probably got no cats left in the world to release there. So the two things have to go hand in hand um, and that's why we work with organisations like the Amur, Leopard and Tiger Alliance, uh, which is one of the, the forerunners in, uh, in conservation of Amur Leopard as well. I mentioned John Lewis of Wildlife Fests International. Um, uh, yeah, he's one of the, the partners in, in this organisation. And they do a lot of work, um, not just with um, captive bred populations, but out in the wild. I mentioned he's out there at the moment um, in, in the Russian forest. And at Wildlife Heritage Foundation, we're very proud to be one of the sponsors that actually enables him to go and spend three months of the year out there doing that critical research. Um, and actually, here is Dr. Lewis out in the Russian Far East, um, working on one of the wild ammo leopards. So it's not dead. Um, what they do is they're capturing it. They do lots of tests on it. When we're looking at the DNA, it's important to understand the makeup and genetic makeup of the wild population. 
population that's out there today as it is around the population we're trying to look at releasing back out there. Um, and I guess this is just a quote, and I'm not going to read it word for word, but it just gives you the idea that without organisations like ours, and, and we're not alone, there are other places that's, that's working on the MLF, but it, it wouldn't work if we were the only place doing this, and we need different organisations. But without organisations like ours, such the release and the reintroduction program that we're looking at, it, it just wouldn't even have got off the ground. So, like I say, the two things have to go hand in hand. Okay, time for the unashamed plea for your support. Um, we're not at the Wildlife Heritage Foundation open to the public. It is a breeding conservation centre. The focus is on the cats and what we're trying to do to increase the populations. Uh, but we do offer experiences. Um, and the type of experience we offer is like a big cat encounter where you get given a guided tour around um, talk and you get, and we will teach people around cats that we have on site and the work that we do in the conservation um, of, to preserve those species. Um, you can do a ranger for the day and come and shadow one of our keepers and you get to get involved with the feeding, the preparing of the food, cleaning out the enclosures and we also run photographic workshops as well um, where you come and spend a whole day with us um, and we have a resident wildlife photographer uh, who will make sure that you understand the setup and the makeup of your camera um, and will make put you in the best positions to get the best pictures um, of those cats. Um, we are offering 10% discount on our store today. I told you it was only shame if I'd been there. Out on, on stand 109. Uh, and the last bit of the plea for your money for now. If you can't get to Kent, you are able to help the work that we do by donating two pounds via text. The details are here, they're also all out on, on our stand again. Um, I know it's a bit of a cheap when you're standing up here and asking for more of your money, but you know, it seems a great opportunity to pass by. Um, so you can text AMO35-2 to 70070. It'll only cost you two pounds. We will receive the whole two pounds, um, and we promise to spend it wisely on trying to save species like the AMO elephant. So, end of the unshamed and please give us support. I hope that you found what I've said of interest and maybe you've learned something along the way as well. But if you will leave this room and take nothing else from it, please take from, from this talk that if you come together and we will pull in the same direction, then together we really can make a difference. And the story of the ammo leopard goes to prove that if you think of where we've come in the last in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And before I wrap up, um, Wildlife Expo is running a competition on the website um, leading up to this, uh, this exhibition. And a uh, competition which was, the prize was to come down um, uh, one weekend uh, for one lucky winner and to win a ranger for the day and bring a guest with them. Um, the competition, for those that saw it and weren't sure what the answer was, the competition was what, what animal is better known what animal is better known as the um, Panthera pardus orientalis? Now, hopefully everybody in this room will now be able to tell us what that is. Um, but the person who got it right is Lois Dale, and Lois Dale's in the room now, so Lois, if you'd like to come up and uh, receive your voucher.
to answer your question. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, the question was how supportive is the Russian government? Um, and, and the answer is they are supportive. Um, President Putin is a big fan, um, uh, it seems, of Amber Leopards and Amber Tigers. Uh, you wouldn't, we would never have got to the stage that we're at now if we hadn't had the support of the Russian government. Um, and that's kind of one of the big things that's changed over the last 20 years. It's the, until, you know, the political landscape has changed a lot. Um, you know, whatever reasons or whatever's driving that, I guess we don't really care from a political standpoint. We're just interested in the conservation. And it's part of the reason why we sent the likes of a new and little cup out to Japan, because who knows what's going to happen politically in the future. Um, so we're kind of protecting the bloodline, if you like, from any political fallout that may happen in the future. But right now, they are supportive. Okay, well, thank you very much. Please do come and see us on our stands. Um, and some of the team at the back are handing out these bits if you wanted a little bit more information around what we do. But thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.